Welcome to the Barry Trammell Show, and it's Bedlam Week, which means we got to talk about the history of this crazy, crazy series, and nobody better to do it than one of the all-time Bedlam heroes, Tim Lasher, the kicker who nailed the 46-yard field goal in 1983. Before we get to Tim, we got to thank our sponsors, Next Generation Roofing, Weedman Lawn Care, Oklahoma Helpline 988, and Oklahoma Ford Dealers. But now we welcome in Tim Lasher. And Tim, welcome to the show. And I got to ask you, any kind of uh, melancholy here, we're looking at the end of a series that made you famous. <laughs> you know, I, I really, I'm kind of a purist when it comes to sports. And especially when you look at the traditional um, games that we, that have always were a special part of our lives. And um, so, yeah, I think I feel that a little bit, just the fact that this series is probably coming to an end. Um, but that's the way the landscape of college football has gone. I hated it when Nebraska left the conference and, uh, you know, who knows, they probably hate that too, looking back at it now. But, um, you know, there, there's a little sentimentality to that, I'm sure, but that's just the, kind of the way the sport's been going. Well, let's go back a little bit. 1983. Uh, you were, I think you had redshirted already. I think it was your second year in Norman, if I remember right. That's uh, right. Came, up, yep. came mm -hmm. up from Plano, Texas, and a walk on, no scholarship, went out for kicker. And the 1983 season began. You were not the Sooner kicker. Um, you did not debut in Bedlam, October 17, 1983. But it was your first real game in the spotlight when people were really paying attention. Tell us, go back to 1983 and tell us how that you came to be uh, the kicker that Barry Switzer called on. Sure. Well, um, I had walked on in 82, but it was fairly late um, after the season. School had started, and um, so they call it a redshirt season, but it was really just no one paid attention to me. <laughs> it, was, it was different because, you know, when you're a good place kicker in high school, uh, you're kind of a valuable commodity to your team. And, but I didn't realize in college that kickers were kind of a necessary evil in some people's minds. And the only recognition you get is if uh, you're not doing your job quite right. So when I came up to Norman, they had about a dozen kickers on the team. Um, and having another walk on that was five foot eight and 140 pounds didn't exactly appeal to them. And uh, so that first year, I really didn't get much of a look. The spring prior or the spring of 83, um, I did get um, a, a pretty good opportunity to compete for the job. And then but when I came back in the fall of 83, uh, they had brought in a couple of other kickers um, on and put them on partial scholarship. And so I, they weren't that impressed, I guess. Um, so I continued to work my way up through it. And I got to second team. And this is a true story. The, the week before our first game. The first team kicker, we were going live in practice, and he got his leg rolled up on. And so he was injured. And um, they didn't know if he'd be able to go or not, so I was put on the travel squad. I did not find out I was on the travel squad until the Thursday before we left, which was the next day, to go play Stanford. And uh, I was kicking pretty well in pregame warm-up, and Coach Switzer came up to me and asked if I was kicking off better than our regular kickoff guy. And I said, uh, well, I wasn't going to tell him no. So I said, sure, you know, I think I am. And um, so we had a kicking contest 10 minutes before the game. And apparently I won that. And so I kicked off in that game, was not expected to. I was just enjoying the road trip. And um, and then the next, but our, our first team guy struggled a little bit um, in that game. And then the next week we played Ohio State, it was our home opener. And um, in the middle of that game, Coach Switzer called on me to try the – we'd missed a field goal, I think. And so he called on me to kick uh, field goals. And for the next four years, I ended up uh, kicking everything for, for Oklahoma. Well, then let's go to October 17th in Stillwater. Uh, this was not a vintage uh, Switzer team. You guys would go on to win a national championship in 85, contend in 84 and 86. 83, not a great mm -hmm. team. You'd, you'd been struggling. You go to Stillwater, Cowboys get up 20 to three. And Derek Shepard makes the huge play, breaks a couple of tackles, mm -hmm. goes 70 something yards with a, with a uh, screen pass, uh, sort of puts Oklahoma back in the game. 
And then uh, it's a uh, 20, you get within 20 to 18 late in the game. Mm-hmm. And um, there's some miscommunication. There's some miscommunication. Yeah. Uh, discussion yeah. about an onside kick, and they called it off. No onside kick. The word did not get to the kicker. Tell us how that you can, right. uh, you can not tell the kicker what's going to happen, Tim. Yeah, yeah, you know, and the, the funny thing is, you know, leading up to that season, Barry, we were preseason number two, and people forget about that because we had Marcus Dupree, the Heisman Trophy candidate, you know, and the season was going downhill. You know, we lost Ohio State, we lost to Texas, and um, so our ranking was falling down, and Oklahoma State had broke into the top 20 for the first time in a while, and they really thought this was going to be their year and they were going to catch us at a good time. And it probably was. So we get into this game, and I had made one of three field goals going into that game. My first field goal I made was the week before against Texas. And um, when we get into the ball game, nothing's going right. We set the conference record for penalties. I think we had 150 some odd yards in penalties. We'd put the ball on the ground. Um, we were giving the game away. We really were. Oklahoma, and, you know, if you remember, our punter punted a ball into Sonny Brown, our up back's backside, on one play, and Oklahoma State caught it on our five-yard line and ran it in. That was one of their touchdowns. The other one, we fumbled a punt on the five. They ran three plays and lost five yards. And after losing the five yards, we got called for a penalty on a 27-yard field goal that they'd missed which gave them a new set of downs inside the five, and they scored on us. So we were giving the game away. and um, But somehow we, you know, Shep took that little out route and took it to the house, and we started feeling a little bit of life left. And that was with about, I think, nine minutes to go, something like that. And, um, and then when we get out to kick the onside kick, I'm standing on the, on the sideline, and Coach, Coach Proctor, Bobby Proctor, was our special teams guy. And so we're sitting there, and never, we got the onside team around, and he's talking about, let's get ready. We're going to kick it onside left. And um, Coach Switzer comes running over, and he says, Bobby, we're going to kick it deep. We think we can stop him. And I think we had a timeout or two left. And, um, and Bobby said, Coach, we need the ball. And Switzer just turned around and walked away without saying a word. And I don't know if he was going to go back and get back on the headset or what he was going to do, but he just left. So we huddled back up, and I'm like, guys, what do you want me to do? And so they say onside. So I go out, and now when I'm getting the ball from the official, I'm 10 yards in front of the rest of the team. So they had changed their minds back to kicking it deep, and they had given Dwight Drain, uh, one of our defensive backs, a uh, the assignment of telling everybody, well, you know, we have different personnel on those teams. So behind me, unbeknownst to me, we've got guys running on and off the field and Dwight's running up and down telling everybody that we're going to kick the ball deep. But he didn't have the presence of mind to go tell me. And so um, better lucky than good, I guess. You know, I got lined up and I was lined up to kick a onside kick. And as naive as I was, I thought, well, these guys will certainly know that I'm not kicking this deep, you know, or whatever. And uh, so I kicked it onside and I brutalized the onside kick, you know, back on the artificial turf in those days, you just, you would click the top of the ball and try to get it to bounce up high and out jump the other team for the ball. And I hit it, Oh, just right midway through it. And so it was just like a rocket coming off my foot. Cause you do, you swing your leg hard through those, even if you're trying to get a lot of spin, and poor Chris Rockins, who the defensive back for Oklahoma State, is standing there, and there's nobody that would have been able to catch that ball. It was coming too hard and too fast. If I had missed his head, it would have gone into the Oklahoma State sidelines, maybe in the stands. I don't know. It was just so hard hit. And it bounced square off his face right into the hands of Scott Case, and he he was able to gather the ball in and get out of bounds at the 50-yard line, and we had the ball back and and new life. And I did not find out that I was supposed to kick it deep until you all started talking to me after the game in the locker room. Um, Proctor walked up to me, said, you were supposed to kick it deep. You screwed this up. And I thought he was joking. And then everybody started asking me about it. And I didn't, I just, it was such chaos. It truly was bedlam for sure. 
Um, but I didn't know anything about it until you guys started asking questions in the locker room after the game. Hey, let me ask you, 40 years, uh, have you gotten a chance over the years to uh, to meet Chris Rockins and talk to Chris Rockins about that play? Never have, you know, never have, you know, and he was a, he was a really good football player. I think he had a pretty nice NFL yep. career, but I never had a chance to, um, you know, and I, I probably wouldn't bring it up <laughs> if I did meet him. Yeah, you know, I, I guess we'd have a connection, but I'd let him bring that up before I would <laughs> speak up about it, I think, because I know that that, you know, you hate, you know, as a place kicker, you realize that your your legacy is really what you did in pressure situations. You know, that's, um, you know, Uva has seen that with the kick at Ohio State and, you know, the Oklahoma State kick. Again, we're talking about this 40 years later. And unfortunately, some of the bad plays that the people make or the unfortunate ones are have them remembered by that too. And, and Chris was, like I said, Chris, my understanding is he's a really good football player. And um, so I hate that to be his legacy for any reason, but in Soonersville, maybe it is. Yeah, probably is. I mean, Chris Rockins, you don't have to say, uh, talk to very many people before they'll remember 83 Bedlam. Same with yeah, Tim Lash. That's right. Yeah. Well, the same with Tim Lash. Yeah, uh, right. Hey, yeah, uh, all right, that's true. I mean, it's, it, yeah, that's how it is. Sooners uh, move on down the field, I think, to the 29-yard line. It's fourth down. Mm -hmm. Down two, you got to kick a field goal. 46-yarder, five yards longer yeah. than the famous Uve kick against Ohio State. Um, yeah. Did you understand the pressure and the ramifications of that kick at the time, do you think? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I probably didn't. You know, I grew up a pro football fan, kind of a Dallas Cowboys fan, so I didn't really follow college football much. A lot of the Oklahoma history I learned as I lived some of it and kind of gleaned it um, from being a part of it. But um, I was aware of the weight of, of the game simply because of the type of season we were having and how important it was to our team to get a win here. You know, um, the, the in-state rivalry part of it, I probably didn't uh, understand the depth of that for some guys. Um, you know, cause I didn't grow up in Oklahoma and, um, but you know, those are the moments that as a, as a place kicker, you, you only get those once in a while in, at the college game usually. And, but those are what you've been dreaming about. And I had been preparing myself for that kind of a moment, you know, in my own daydreams, I guess, um, for a long, long time. And I knew what it meant. Um, I knew what it meant to our team. And, you know, when you're out there, you really have to focus on uh, your mechanics. And one of the things I, I tell like young place kickers or guys that have ever asked me about it is, you know, in the pressure situations, one or two things happens to people. You either you either focus or you fold one of the two. And, um, you know, thankfully for me, most of the time, I think there was an edge Maybe it was a nervousness or whatever it was, but it really forced me. Maybe it was fear <laughs> of failure, um, but it really forced me to focus a lot on on what was at hand. And um, nobody knows how to re how to respond to place kickers in those situations. It's I think the most similar thing would be a, a pitcher that's getting into the deep innings that's got a no hitter going. You know, nobody wants to talk to him. Nobody knows what to say to him. You, you don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, and so that particular day, Jimmy Johnson had called a timeout. Um, and I was left to myself on about the 50 yard line, just kind of to ponder everything. And there was two things going through my head. Keep your head down and follow through. That was it. Don't, don't, um, don't pull back. Don't be, you know, if you're going to miss it, miss it big. And, um, and so that was the only thing that I was thinking the entire time. And Kevin Atkins, the deep snapper, and Scott Case was the holder. They just did a great job, and and uh, we were able to put it through. You know, I've always made this uh, point or argument, ever what you want to call it, Tim. You know, you guys were in the midst of a bad year by OU standards. The previous two mm -hmm. seasons were not what Switzer had established. This was his third straight subpar season. Switzer's like a lot of coaches. Tons of people loved him, but he had a few enemies, and there were mm -hmm. there were people that wouldn't have minded seeing Barry Switzer uh, go down the road in 1983. Uh, mm -hmm. A five loss—you guys ended up losing four games that year. A five yeah, loss season, 
a five off season would not, I'm not saying Switzer would have been fired, but it's at least feasible and possible. I think that Oklahoma State, that fourth quarter in Stillwater, potentially saved Barry Switzer's job. Your kick, Shepard's play, and mm-hmm. just in the rally after that, of course, uh, you guys have the great defense for the next four years. Jamel comes in, the wishbones revive. All of that mm-hmm. might not have happened um, if you guys hadn't, hadn't uh, pr- produced those heroics uh, at Lewis Field that day. You know, that's – let me go on record as saying it would have been a shame if that were the case, but you, you might be right. And a lot of it was, there was a lot of other things going on in 1983 when you, when you started seeing, um, you know, the way Marcus left the program, a lot of people blame coach Switzer for, you know, the handling of, of a star player, you know, uh, like that. But we had a lot of star players. I mean, we had a lot of great football players on our team. But you're right. By our standards, um, the fan base can get pretty fickle. And I think depending on who you lose to also. And in that season, we lost to Texas. We lost to Nebraska. We lost to Missouri and Ohio State. And then we would have lost to Oklahoma State. Um, I, it, that never occurred to me. And again, that would have been ridiculous because obviously the man could coach. He we we could have won four national championships the next four seasons if things had fallen together. Um, but uh, it, that could have been the case. And I later heard um, and through the grapevine a little bit that um, there was some discussion of that. And um, there was some higher up people that really kept that from happening. Um, but I don't know if that game had gone differently, if that would have if that would have changed anything or not. Again, it would have been ridiculous if it had, but um, (laughs) the the way things fall for coaches, especially today, if it were today, I think that would have certainly happened probably. Yeah. You you better win in two years. Thanks to Bob Stoops. You know, (laughs) that's true. All right. Take us to the kick. You better win fast. Take us to that kick itself. Ball is snapped. You take your step Mm -hmm. forward. Tell us what – take us through that kick. Um, we were lined up on about the right upright, um, and there was very little wind by that time of the game. And um, the uh, – but any wind that we did have would have been at my back. Um, and, you know, it was funny because in pregame, I could not make a field goal. I was horrible. And I, and then one of the guys said, and this is the old Lewis field, which was almost an open bleacher right. stadium in, in some way. Yep. And I can't remember his name, but one of the punters for Oklahoma state came up to me and he said, when it fills up, it, the wind calms down. Cause I couldn't hit anything. I actually hit my kicking coach in the head with a, a ball fell off the tee and I kicked it and hit him in the head and, you know, got a little applause from the Stillwater fans. And I was like, Oh gosh. And so it was not, you know, there was nothing to think I would make it, but, when I got to the kick, I had made a field goal earlier in the game, a 42 yarder. Um, and Barry, I literally was taking my steps back before that kick, thinking to myself, if you miss this, you're probably out of a job because I would have been one of four on field goals if I'd missed the first one. But at least you gave it a shot. And I made the field goal, and you would have thought I won the Super Bowl the way I celebrated the first one. So by the time we got to this one, it was all focus. It was, um, you know, I, I had I gathered my thoughts. I actually, I remember a very calm um, feeling while I was waiting, you know, because the timeouts was two minutes long. and um, But I just remember a calm coming over me, uh, just about, just focus. And um <laughs> I, I don't know where that came from. It may have been divine intervention or something because it's nerve wracking to do that. But I was very calm. And I just remember thinking, like I said, keep your head down and follow through. The ball came back. I left a little late. Um, it was pretty close to getting blocked. I think it was Mark Moore that dove across and he got he was he was at my feet by the time the ball by the time I followed through. Um, but I knew the minute I hit it. It was going exactly where I wanted it to go. Um, I, my target was just inside the right upright, and since it had some distance on it, I thought it would pull back to the left a little bit. And um, but I knew when I hit it, I crushed it, and um, it was up in the air. And 
I started jumping up and down knowing it was going to go through. And, uh, I think on the third time I tried to jump, Scott case grabbed my waist and I was still trying to jump. So I looked like an idiot little kid, you know? Um, and then Brent Burks, I'll never forget this. Brent Burks came over and we were face mask to face mask while Scott still had me up on his shoulder. And uh, Brent Burks was crying and just going, I love you. I love you. I love you. And I think that's when I realized the depth of the Oklahoma kids <laughs> needing to win this game if you were an Oklahoma Sooner. Cause, and no disrespect to Oklahoma State, but it was, it was embarrassing to lose to Oklahoma State back then. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was a given that we would win the game, um, to, in our minds anyway. So it was just really um, – it was a cool moment because – Walking on and um, dreaming about this for a long time, that was kind of personally, that was this, uh, that was a dream moment for me. I just, that was, I was in heaven, you know, if, if, uh, if football was my God, that was my heaven at the time. So it was really special. Have you thought much about how that kick has affected, impacted your life these last 40 years? Sure. Yeah. I, I it, that's, it, it's, you know, it's funny because you're a little bit in obscurity. Um, you know, they call your name a lot as a kicker cause you're out there every time you score. Um, but it's, it's really obscure. Um, people are kind of complaining about you as much as they're praising you a lot of times. And that went from who is this kid to, can I have your wristbands? You know, we, when I, the, you know, that year, we gave out two game balls. I got one, and, the, and it was both for the Oklahoma State game. And, and Switzer gave one to the band. The Pride got a right. game ball that day. And, but literally, overnight, it went from kind of obscurity to um, this place where people were asking me, to, can I have your wristband? Can I have your chin strap? Can I have your auto? You know, all that kind of stuff. And media wanted to talk to us. And um, so it was, it was different. I mean, it was very different and it's kind of an immediate change. And here we are. I mean, it's 40 years ago, which is hard to believe, but people still talk about it. I just had somebody ask me about it yesterday. And, um, and it's a unique story because of the onside kick and everything, but, um, you know, it solidified, uh, my position on the team. You know, ironically, I didn't get a scholarship right after that. I didn't get a scholarship until the first day of class in 1984. Um, but it was, uh, it, it has never been lost on me what that meant. E even if I lost the job later, that that is a, a place in Sooner history that um, has, has seemed to have meant a lot to people. Um you know, it wasn't for a national title or anything. We, we, we had bigger games where some of the points were more important. Um, but that this this I think the whole surrounding of the whole thing and Jimmy Johnson being the head coach at Oklahoma State and them being good for the first time in a long I mean, really on a national level in a long time and to kind of get through what we were going through as a team after Marcus had left. It was it was a very meaningful experience. Yeah. When you, I mean, you're still around Norman. Yeah, you, you have a heat and air business in Norman. Uh, Barry Switzer's still around town. I'm mm -hmm. sure you run into him every once in a while. When you guys mm -hmm. see each other, do you still talk about 1983, or is it just a gleam in his eye when when he sees? Oh, you? we we uh, this time of year it certainly comes up. You know, I mean, uh, I was really uh, flattered one time because. I was at an event that he was also at. And one of the guys I was with said, Hey, you remember this guy? And Switzer goes, he won football games for me, you know? <laughs> and so, and I'm not the only one, you know? And I think sometimes they put, you know, too much weight on those late field goals. I mean, it's, there's a lot of pressure. Um, but it, you know, if they don't get me in field goal range, I'm not going to be able to kick a field goal. And so it's, those are always team efforts and they may be the last point scored in the game, but it, they're no more important than any point scored in the game. But um, we, we reflect on it every now and again. But, you know, when you get around Coach Switzer, he's such a huge presence. And he's got a memory that is like an, a, a vault. And so 
he remembers players that didn't play for him. He remembers their parents. I, I've been in events with him that he can remember recruiting trips and whose family members were in the room when he was recruiting people. So he's such a big guy and he's got so many of those memories. It's, it's one of the, the ones we fondly remember and we'll talk about it once in a while, but um, he's, he, he's got, he's got a lot of great players that he is very loyal to. And I really appreciate about that about him. You know, I think he just turned 86 years old. And when we have events, um, reunions or, or team events, he all, he's always there. He's always there. And a lot of guys may not say they're not feeling good and they don't want to be around, but Coach Switzer is always there for his players. And I really appreciate that about him. Well, Tim, this has been fun. This has been great. Uh, every year uh, when Bedlam rolls around, uh, your, your uh, kick in 1983 uh, springs to memory. And, of course, with Bedlam going away forever how long, uh, special emphasis this year, 40-year anniversary of uh, what I consider the most important field goal in OU football history, uh, even Trump and Uve's kick at Ohio well, State. You. So uh, we appreciate you, you joining us. It's been great, uh, been great chatting with you. Hey, remember to stay tuned every week for the Barry Trammell Show. Get on uh, all the places you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, iTunes, Spotify. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. You can check out more Sooner football content on sellout.com. Talk to you next week.